So welcome to No Shame episode 35 here at the Lima Pound SPG D24 studio. We have my man, John Connors on. And when Connor, John, it's no way. John, no Connors? No, no yeah, do you know what? Because I did tell someone I had John Connors on, he's like, Jesus, I love that film Cardboard Gang. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 that's not me. This is a different one, this is a, we, mm. we'll, we'll get him on another yeah. week. But, but this week, this guy is probably one of the most Probably the most qualified, I'd say, but between you and I, I'd say, um, strength conditioning coaches in the country. Uh, we're, we're we're up there. We're there's up different. There. There's different specialities. Listen, different you were talking about a PhD. Yeah, to, that's to, what I'm doing at the moment. He's yeah. doing a PhD in strength and conditioning. Like, I do my strength and conditioning thing with Foss, and I thought I was the dog's <laughs> bollocks. <laughs> All right, but so it's a little bit after your first qualification. I'd yeah, say. yeah, yeah. So tell me what your qualification are there. So at the moment, well, I I do courses all the time. So I have a master's in exercise and nutrition science, and I'm doing a PhD in human health and performance with a specialty in weight cutting and combat sports. Savage. Yeah, and then I've like personal training qualifications. Uh, I've a lot of soft tissue work like dry needling, dry needling, uh, active release technique, uh, muscle activation technique. So I've I've probably like done. 40 courses like I've worked it out the other day I've probably spent about this 150 you. grand on education do you know someone told me that at my housing estate someone, someone one of the oldest told me he's like you train with John Connors don't you and I was like oh, yeah really? yeah he's like do you know he spent over 100 grand on qualifications <laughs> so I was like how do you know this way yeah. you know what I mean and he wouldn't, it was a guy I didn't expect to know this in anyway but anyway John John and the, and the OSI, the Irish Strength yeah. Institute, have, have have a huge part to play and had a huge part to play in in the success of, of all of us lads and, and, and the Irish invasion and, and, and the kind of success that we had on the, the MMA world, if you must, because right at the start, um, we we were still doing stupid shit. You you can tell us. What were we doing before? When well, basically what happened, like, it's nine years we're working with SPG. Nine years. Yeah, yeah. So it was after... Tom Egan's fight. And Tom was the, it was the fight that you kind of... He, met yeah, him. so it was kind of like John Kavanagh realised, he was like, I can't... John Kavanagh was doing everything. He was the nutritionist. The, the strength the, yeah, he was yeah. He was doing everything. Well, you remember like, that camp idea. Remember and he was that. like, I can't... I think after being exposed to the, the UFC, he was like, right, they have specialists yeah. in every area to look after stuff. And what happened was, Cottle Pendred was uh, training in... An MMA gym, which be, which was beside our first gym, Three Castles and, or something. It was a castle. I can't gym? remember even the it name was. of it, but we had Cottle, hair. Cottle being Cottle, had yeah, 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 curly <laughs> hair. We had hair. Cottle, uh, you being Cottle him. was always looking for how can I improve, and he's looking for every avenue. And he was just like, "Geez, these guys look what they know what they're doing." So we did some training with those guys, and then when he moved over to SBG, he was speaking to John. He was like, "These guys are really good. You should bring them in." So. Own Lacey, my business partner, went over and spoke to John, and then we've been working with you guys ever since. But it was like we did at the start, we did everything we did the strength and conditioning, the recovery, the nutrition, the, the weight cutting. cutting. And again, it's like what we did back then the is completely, rehab. yeah, yeah, the rehab. Um, so we kind of did a bit of everything, and it's kind of, as I said, it's like I've kind of followed my passion in that sense, where I've been like there's a huge gap in research and literature on weight cutting. And that's kind of like, it was funny, um, is that Alex Nealon? Alex Nealon. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I was listening to him on the other day and it was like, it was funny, like so many of the things you were saying, we used to do that and I was like, oh, balls, I told Paddy to do that. Yeah. <laughs> but, but again, it's like, at the, we, like I always say, is like anything we do, when we're telling you to do that, that's the best information we have 100%. at that time. It's, it's like, it's evolving. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, evolves. and it's uh, and we're always improving the system. Like, it, like I can remember like, um, uh, Cottle and Chris Fields being in our gym in Richmond Road and like killing themselves <laughs> to make weight, like you know, absolutely destroying some of themselves. Them were disgraceful, weren't yeah, they? Some yeah, of them were and it's and it's kind of like and and that was I think Cottle was even making middleweight then it wasn't even welterweight and it was like the the kind of what they had to go through was incredible and and again it's like you're looking at it going there has to be a better way and it's over time it's like right let's take this piece of the puzzle and how can we improve that. All right, that's better. Let's go. But like, I remember one of the things was when we first came in, like, cause we're strength and conditioning guys mainly. It was like, oh, if you're in better shape, you'll be a better fighter. Yeah. So everyone looked great, but fuck crap. So yeah. it was like, right, that's too much strength and conditioning. And we almost went the other way. I was like, right, that's too little. And they're like, guys, where their fitness was letting them down. And it's yeah. one of those things is your fitness should never let you down. No. Like it's, it's one of those, it's, it's so controllable, it's, and it's just a case of, just put in the hours, and that'll happen. But the thing that gets in between that, is, is the weight cut. 
Yeah, like yeah. You can put the hours in and have the, the fitness. And, and and that's the biggest thing I'm seeing at the moment is like, you could dehydrate just say X amount and you know go from. So what what, 85. Would, the, what would the recommended um, percentage? I know we did this with Alex Neil as well, but the percentage of say. Because I know you used to give us the percentage, and you're like, I, I know Owen one time said to me, you, you couldn't make, well, not couldn't make fly weight, but like, you shouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's kind of... Is it 10% or something? It's 10%, but if you take, it, it is 10%. So if you're, say, 77 kilos, right. seven kilos, you can make lightweight, which is 70 which kilos, is 70, right? Yeah. But that's fully hydrated, full of carbohydrates. You're not depleted at, at yeah. all. So some people will deplete themselves to 77 and then start a weight cut. No, it's like, and yeah. I always say, that's like, if you're weighing in on a Friday, that's a Saturday beforehand, but you're, you know, you're, you're 100%. You're ready to go. 100%, like you've had, you're, you're, you haven't cut out carbs. So it's, I, and I think the problem is, is like people hear about these huge weight cuts and think, I can do that. And I think it's, like you hear like, Johnny Hendricks used to say like, oh, I, I come from 230. Yeah, but you're a fat 230. That's yeah. not a cut. That's a diet yeah. To and a it's point. a lifestyle as well. So I'd say when he finishes, yeah. he goes, he slobs out and goes, oh, you get to 230, it's grand. Or oh, you haven't gone, ever gone past 230. Yeah, so yeah. But it gets harder as you yeah, get older. And it, But as I said, it's like, so 10% is the upper limit. Right. right. That's the upper limit. And like anything you have, any any quality you have, like, you know, uh, strength, endurance, there's adapters and non-adapters. So some people are just brilliant at cutting weight. So they, like, they really don't know why. But like say, if we're talking, Cottle was really good at cutting very weight. Cut Connor yeah. is very good at cutting weight. Yeah. You know, there's guys that it's literally like, you can cut down, come back, and you're fine. 100%. Right? I find that when myself, they were like, I can cut the weight. I could probably make yeah. 51 kilos. Get <laughs> yeah, weight. yeah. But it's the getting back. I feel, yeah. like, I feel like I'm going to be sick. Like yeah. I know before I flew away, it was kind of like fighting after, after a dose yeah. of something. And it... <laughs> This is another thing. So, I remember we were in Boston for the you were fighting. What was his name? Howell or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But and I was chatting to you. I'd arrived in and I was chatting to you and I was like, "Yeah, you do on the water load." You're like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." And you're making a cup of tea and I'm like, yeah. "How much? How much? How much tea do you drink for this?" And he goes, "Oh, just I do the water load with tea." With tea and I was yeah. like, "With tea?" And yeah. I was like, "With just plain tea? No, milk, sugar." sugar. I was like, oh, "What the no. hell?" And you were doing. I think you were doing 10 litres when litres. it should have been 6 litres. I was pouring my water. Yeah, because yeah, I asked Carl. Yeah. I turned out to Carl and said, what do we do for the water load, Carl? He's like, what you do is you drink 10 litres of water. But yeah, he but that's off like, him. Yeah, he yeah. wasn't considering that yeah, he's a yeah. mammoth. Like, and it's, it's based off your body weight. Yeah, what you like, are, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was 20 kilo at the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, yeah, I was, I, I found that, I said, like that it didn't affect me, but, Someone said to me, but the tea is a diuretic as well, so it couldn't dry out a little bit yeah, more. Yeah, yeah. Let's pour it beyond even but more. I, but, but I think <laughs> as well as it's it's how long you take to do it, and it's what you're trying to move. So you kind of have, uh, let me see, you have fluid you can manipulate, right? Fluid. Which is the main thing you're you're manipulating. So you're talking, and that should only be a 24-hour window, but people extend that. So when I mean manipulate that, that's like you're dehydrating yourself, you're, you're cutting out fluids. Mm -hmm. Um so you, you have to make sure that it, it, if that is done for, for too long, you will definitely impact performance. Then you have your glycogen stores, which is your carbs. So if you're on a low-carb diet, you've the depleted your already, glycogen yeah, stores yeah, yeah. anyway. So there's nowhere to go. Now, that takes about two to four days, depending on say you. Say guys, because um, this is a question we get as well, um, say guys that are using, say, a bike or running or all of this stuff to cut weight, say water weight. Okay. Away. Would, would their glycogen be like ac access straight away? Well, it's kind of as soon as you go low carb, you're depleting your glycogen right. stores, and then depending on the type of exercise you do, you're depleting glycogen stores again. So if you are using energy to cut weight, you're in a, a yeah, vulnerable yeah. position for but glycogen it, to be getting. Yeah, but it's kind of like, and this is another thing we're looking at studying is like how you dehydrate can affect your recovery. So it's kind of like active and passive dehydration. So. Active uh, dehydration would be you're skipping, right, you're right, on the bike, right, right, right. and that can have an impact. So if you run, that's harder on the body than cycling. Yeah, and then kind of skipping would be in between. Versus, uh, and then even like then passive dehydration is like sitting in a sauna or sitting in a uh, hot bath. So that's one of the studies that we're actually conducting at the moment is looking at the difference between hot baths, hot baths with salt. 
So the Epsom salts. Without the, yeah. Seeing which of those two is better, and then we're going to compare that to the sauna, and then figure out which one of those is better, then compare it to active dehydration. So my hypothesis is that the salt bath is the easiest on the body. So you will remove the same amount of fluid, but because it hasn't taken as much energy out of you, you can recover better. Right. So that's kind of what we're looking at this, at the minute. This is, this yeah. Is what I, uh, this is what I've kind of felt. I felt that that that. that but would I think be. that was a, a huge revelation for us was when we started doing the hot baths and people were like this was fucking way easier than yeah. the sauna. Oh, like, just, like and um, I don't know if you mind saying like with uh, Keith or not with his last fight, the fight before that, he kind of tried to cut to fluids too soon. He came down to the ISO, he had barely energy to do anything, so we stuck him in the sauna. He was in the sauna for an hour, lost zero. Oh. Right? And that's heartbreaking. That's a, that's and, I, heartbreak. and, and for me, I'm trying to be like, that's fine. <laughs> Don't worry yeah. about that. And we went over to the uh, hotel, did the hot bath, the hot salt bath, and he lost four pounds. Oh, you know, so. and that was like, I think, 15, 20 minutes in the hot bath. And then. Wrapped up. And straight away, and uh, Artem Loboff is great for this sort of stuff. He's because he's real like, don't try and make these things easier, make them work. And it was real like he says, as soon as you stand up out of bath, dry off, beanie on, start putting your clothes oh, on yes. in yeah, there. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. the hardest thing is that it's hard to start sweating if you start getting more and more dehydrated. Yeah. And so, as soon as you stand up, dry off, get your beanie on, cover up. And so you're walking out, covered up, and then you jump into the bed, cover yourself up, yeah. and it's literally just your face is sticking out. And it was amazing how the sweat was just pissing off him there. Well, well. And then his last fight, he, he made it easy. He was like, I can't believe how easy that was. It's because, as I said, if it, you think it's better to extend out certain periods, but that actually makes it harder on the body. Yeah, You know what I mean? Like... um you seen with Darren Till recently? Did you watch that video of him yeah, cutting yeah, weight? I've seen it. There's, there's a good few ones now, actually. Yeah, there's another but, one with Dean Garnett. Have you seen that one? No, I haven't seen that. Try one. check that one. Yeah. It is actually um, it's a doctor that does it with him. Yeah, and does like urine samples all the way. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I might have seen that one. Yeah, uh, I probably good, have. Really uh, but he did it through the night, was it? Was that the, the was that the so, one where yeah. he like stayed awake, which I think is yeah, that's, hard that's, enough on the body. Is hard you're making things yeah. harder as well. But uh, yeah, with, with Darren Till is like. I think the problem was was that he was sweating, he was losing weight, and then he stopped because he had to go to the hospital to meet his girlfriend. Right, right. she was, And so as soon as you cool down, it took so much energy to get sweating again. That's what killed him. It was, it was trying yeah. to get up yeah, again. Yeah. But and I, again, I don't know how long they, they took doing things, but it's kind of like, it, it, depending on what you're trying to cut, you're trying to maximise the kind of window you do it in, as in maximise the results. So if you're trying to dehydrate for too long, it actually gets much harder. Yeah, yeah. Rather than going, you know. Is it like anything that your body kind of gets a little bit of accustomed to and it kind of... I, I think as well as... So, um, you have a hormone that, that makes you uh, retain water, aldosterone. Now, it's there's a European way of saying it in American. I'm not sure which one I'm saying. So That's a hard enough one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's like estrogen and estrogen. I always like, which one is it? But anyway, so... With this one, if if you're trying to dehydrate for too long, aldosterone goes up, so you you hold on to water. So if you dehy, so if you minimize the window you're trying to dehydrate, the impact of that is less. Right, right, right. right. So, and that's what you're trying to do is maximize the window you do it in. Like um, some fighters, I know. So if you start sweating, you want to maximize the window that you can stay sweating in, it, rather than letting it stop and then restart. Exactly. Again. Or it's like, you know, all right, I'm weighing in on the Friday, so I'm going to start dehydrating from the Wednesday. No, you're better. Like, oh, it, no, I know, I know. So it's kind of like to stop your fluid intake is 24 hours. So if you're weighing in at 4 p.m. on the Friday, it's 4 p.m. on the Thursday, you stop taking in fluids. Yeah, yeah. And then you might, on the Thursday night, go to bed and do, just do the bat, and then... Don't do anything else. You're just getting used to it. And I say to guys, do the bats all week, but it's only for five, ten minutes. So you're used to yeah, it. Yeah, so it's yeah. not a shock to the system as well. And then when you get up in the morning of the weigh-in, it's that's when you're trying to maximize fluid dehydration. Yeah. You so know? you're actually going for Yeah, like you're not like the week of a fight, you're not losing body fat. Like you're talking you might lose two hundred to five hundred grams. This is because this now, that can make a difference, but you you're not losing fat no, the week of the no, fight. No. So this is what people th this is the the big mistake I think <clears throat> that people say. If you look at somebody and they're mm. doing a weight cut but they're like they're loose and they're pudgy and you can visually see body fat. And we're yeah. really saying that 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 kind of already did it wrong. It's yeah, yeah. So the whole thing is you you need to be as lean as possible for you, but still maximize performance. So I do um, a lot of work with Shane McGuigan and his boxers, 
And Shane thinks, now again, is you can't really study this, but he thinks certain people, you go b- below a certain body fat and you become chinny, as he says. So yes, you're, yeah. you're easier to knock out. And I think that's slightly different for everyone. I think some people can be absolutely shredded and it won't affect them, where other people, they might lose a little bit too much. And But again, you're talking, that might be only a, a kilo, a kilo and a half. Uh, that could be a mental thing. As yeah, well, yeah. Where, where, where if you get a bang and you're a little bit lighter, you feel a little, like, as a little bit heavier. Yeah, you yeah, know what I mean? yeah. You're like, you don't feel as chunky and as strong as you were. Like, I, I'm not chunky and strong, but I know the fact that when I'm at 57 kilo, I know that I'm like, right, I can feel that there's a difference there. And like, But I wonder, is that a case of maybe, again, dehydrating too much? And and this and the problem is with a lot of research now is like, right, so if, if I want to get through ethics approval, they only really let you dehydrate or drop body mass of 5%. Right. Right. What I was like... Oh, total overall so total. 10% is yeah totally yeah effective. yeah so to, now you can observe someone going beyond it but you can't make an intervention on them so but the problem is is that like so say for instance they've banned the ivs right. and they're saying right there's no difference between fluid rehydration and iv hydration but that's only going to five percent right so that is true there's no real difference if you do an iv versus if you orally rehydrate okay but that's not what fighters do like, who cuts 5%, less than 5%? Gunny? No, Gunny probably, yeah. yeah. That's about it. Like, Gunny probably, like, as they say, he skips breakfast the morning of the weigh-in and he makes weight. Yeah. But a lot of people, it's like 8, 9, 10%. Some people... So that could be completely different on the body. You know what I mean? And I, after they... So, because the, the measurements are only made on, on 5%. 5%. Right, right, right. right. And it, the thing <clears> about it is, is that... And then it depends on how you measure performance decrements, right? So if you look at power and strength they're not really affected by, uh, even if like, if we dehydrate you and measure you within two hours of, tr- of starting your rehydration, there's no real difference in strength and power to when you're fully hydrated. But if I look at your endurance, <clears throat> that can still be affected 36 hours later. Right, right, right. You know, if you rehydrate incorrectly. That actually makes a lot of sense. So, and, and that's, that like, and part of that is thermoregulation. So I remember the fight you had in Canada Completely would dominate the first round, and you said, "I just got so hot then, I got so warm, I just got that's so like, warm." And, I, and, and I again, it's a like big feeling I used to yeah. have was uh, overheating. If you yeah, must. and that's a big thing of like hydrating well, and you like guys don't like if you're only a little bit dehydrated, like two three percent, that can affect your 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 ability your ability to to regulate temperature. Yeah, that's... and I think as well. I think it's I think being ginger. I think we have a harder time. There's a reason we're further north. Yeah. Is is that we have a harder time regulating temperature? Like the fucking heat. I was came out today and I was like, thank God it's cloudy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I looked out the window today and I like said a little prayer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is much better. Because but I, need, I, need, but I think there's a genetic thing in that as well as that your ability to control your temperature and I, and again first round you probably noticed nothing. No. And then second round it was like he upped his he upped a little bit. And then I was like, it kind of feels like you're breathing in hot air. Yeah, that's yeah. literally what it felt like. And, and that's you're, like, kinda, so, you're breathing in, but the air is warm. Yeah, do you know what I mean? but as I said, it's, that's that's your ability to to rehydrate. And as I said, compared to now, that was 2015, 2014, 2014, 2014, 2014, 2014, 2014, 2014, 2014, 2014, 2014 yeah, yeah, was it? Yeah, All right, but in around, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's like um, <clears throat> a massive thing of like how we would have rehydrated would be different now to right. then. And again, as I said, it's it's a learning it's, yeah, process. Yeah, yeah. But I said, it's like at the time, it was like, you'd so little to go on. It was more like experience as in, how do you feel? Shit. Right, we need to change <laughs> something. Or how do you feel? Great. And I and one of the biggest things I always remember over the years with, as I said, with Cottle had some of the most extreme ones. And by the end, his biggest thing was, he said, I felt like I could fight when I stood on the scales. Versus before... It was literally get me off here oh, as no, quickly as no, possible, no. and that and 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 that's what you have to kind of get to the point. Now, if you could probably feel like you can fight, but as soon as you start fighting, you probably couldn't. But it's it's to get to that point where I feel all right standing on the scales. I'm not like desperate to run off and get and get fluids yeah, into. And me. you know what? I think that's probably important as well because in that moment, you're just about to like face someone that you're you're going to fight, and having the mental situation where you're kind of like you're ready like they can see it and you can see it and it lasts for the day do you get what I mean like yeah. um, I, I remember times that I have been on this and, and I can remember times where I felt great and times where I felt shit but I kind of felt like I did the same thing do you get what I mean yeah, yeah. and then but like looking at somebody when you feel ready 
can nearly like shit they feel that you're there you know what I mean but if you look at somebody when you're dead like it's very it's very you, you don't give that feeling to them that you're you're dying y- yeah you, you, you're just in a, like in Dublin <clears throat> I remember seeing the guy that I was, I was competing against and he was sitting there and he was in bits and he couldn't even look me in the eye and yeah. I remember saying to myself oh my god I've won and you were bouncing as soon oh, as you see that you started that's bouncing it, it yeah, actually yeah, gave yeah. you like an adrenaline kind yeah. of uh, like, I know it's, it's it's psychological warfare as well but at least you could do it exactly you know what I mean at least you could you had the energy to do that I think I was sucking on the cola bottle or something. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean sucking the so say like way back to the start of it all you, you was like collecting you have been collecting this information for a long long time like nearly point. 10 years nearly 10 yeah, years nearly 10 and years you would have been like the, the, the first group of guys to be like focusing on every part of an MMA athlete if you yeah, when yeah. because the sport was only coming to the country 10 years ago like and it was that was still cowboy times yeah oh yeah but it was it was good times as well because there was there was a, a big team that competed all the time and there was lots of shows there was loads of shows and you know there was a lot of as well there was a lot of really good because this is the way I couldn't explain I won't say the old school MMA and the new school is that when you came back to the gym you always wanted to have like a big fish like if, yeah, if, yeah. You know, if you be somebody that kind of I won't say wasn't anybody I wasn't in, but it wasn't really as impressive but if you came back and you be some like the time Artem came back and had beat Dave Hill yeah it was like huge that, that was a big fish you know what yeah, I mean? it was, yeah. holy shit and what it is, is you turn it around and you go back to your training partner and you go harder and harder harder because you know that like there's something in the room there there's something happening you know what I mean that's kind of egging us on but even like crazy stuff like you've had Chris and uh, but him talking about like at, at, at start like He's like sparring you. Yeah. You know, yeah, like, yeah, like yeah, yeah. 100 kilo Chris Fields is sparring 65 kilo Paddy well, Hula. Literally and it was literally so just like, well, that's what we did. That's not horrible. Yeah. Yeah. And again, part of it is, is because um, there were so few of you as well, it was like, now there's like, you can have it, right, the under 65, 65 to 80. Yeah, because you've yeah. got so many f- people yeah, in the yeah. room. As I said, the other day I was down and the sparring's gone on, and it turned out where everyone had mixed in, <laughs> but I was like, um, a big guy, and I think it was actually a smaller girl, and they were like, oh, what are we going to do? And I'm like, spar! <laughs> but like, be clever, you know what I mean? It's like, because I remember times where two of us were sparring cotton at the same time. Right, like, right. You know what I mean? And like, the mental times, but yeah. probably the best of times, and the, the, the funniest of times where everyone was like, because I remember, I was saying this to Chelsea this morning, I was like, when I was coming in, I was like, should I have, like, have John Connor on today? It's, uh, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Is that the guy out Terminator? I was like, no, 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 it's the other John <laughs> The guy out Cowboy Gangsters? No, that's the other Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, There's a lot of us out there. But I said, I remember John uh, like stretching me and, and doing needles on me and telling me, like, when you guys make it, like, and, and then when you get money to do this and all, and I remember thinking to myself, like, not like putting pressure on us, but like, like, but believing you, in yeah, it. Yeah, you believed yeah, in us. Like, but because we were, you seen other athletes. You were, yeah. you were working with Carl Frampton at the time. And, yeah. and you were, I think, and like, you were relaying a lot of the stuff on the Carl's camps as Back well. Back and forth. Back and yeah. forth. Yeah, so as I said, it's like me and Shane, like I, like I started working with Carl and Shane seven years ago. So it's kind of like being a bit of back and forth and, I tried this and I tried that and now Shane kind of it seems like he was like John at the start where he did everything he did the nutrition the boxing coaching he would do the weight cuts with the guys like he would actually physically do a lot of the weight yeah, cuts he, yeah he had to feel like it yeah and um, so me and him would kind of be going back and forth and then over time now he started to bring in different people to take over stuff like a, a guy Daryl Richards that works from that does all the strength and condition for the guys on a day to day basis, and then me and Daryl will kind of go back and forth now about do you think about this, you know, moving this around to there. So it's kind of like it's always evolving, like, and you know, and again, it's like looking at the result and then trying to see, well, did that work and not work, and then trying to build on it. Like, the problem sometimes is that everything is dictated by the result. So if you lose, everything was crap, if you win, everything was great, and you have to try and separate out the different pieces yeah. to be like. No, no, that was really good, even though the result wasn't what we wanted. Yeah, yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? So, as I said, it's like, in the past, of like rather than just going, oh, I have to... Like, you see with fighters all the time, they lose a fight, move camps, everything changes. I know. You know, rather than really try to divorce yourself from the emotional result mm-hmm. and try and be very analytical. Scientific, like, go back to the like the, the book <clears throat> and what you wrote down and what way it worked. That would be a good example, sorry, of the idea of um, me saying that... Y- like you, people change all that cardio because maybe they got the the reload or the weight cut a little bit. But it wasn't but nothing to do with that. It was nothing to do yeah, with the cardio. Yeah, yeah, the cardio yeah. was perfect. It was yeah. just the little idea of the, like the the fuel injection, if you must, was was tampered. Yeah, yeah. So like you're not going to change a car's engine because 
the fuel pump or something like that just happens to be off the time. Yeah, you change yeah. that part. But of even like say for instance with Chris Fields, like he's his like Chris Fields would in the build up doing everything would be one of the fittest guys. And then you see him in the cage, the amount of times he got tired, he yeah. would t- say himself, because he was cutting to middleweight. And it was just, and I think that was the problem is he could cut to it, but he couldn't recover from it. That, do you know what? You know, and it's the same sort of, and it, it, now we have systems in place where we can test you. Yeah. Are you going you to know, be all right? And, and the, t- the, the thing with it is, is it's not an emotion, it's a, it's a number. So you can't argue with the number. And, it, and, and then again, it's, it's trying to establish the right number. Yeah. You know, and the right test. So, like, one of the things I'm looking at at the minute is performance can be correlated with how high you jump, so your vertical jump. But That's been it for a long time, hasn't it? Exactly. Like, so we always use that as a, as a score of readiness. But the thing about it is, so if I, and this is where details matter, is that when I look at uh, how high you jump, you can get tired and change how you jump to still hit the same height. So stuff like you might drop lower in the jump to get the same yeah, height. Yeah, yeah. But in a fight, if you're taking longer to do stuff... You get hit. And that's just... You know, like sometimes you say, I just felt slow. I just felt off. There was no pop. And that can be the same thing. So even though it can look the same, how you do it is slightly different. Like <clears throat> a really good example is of it is uh, Gunny Nelson, how he moves. So he doesn't take a lot to load to move. And that's why people are... He's very deceptive. Yeah, exactly. So, <clears throat> someone who's really, say, bad explosively... Is he's so loose? A, a bit of it, but he's so explosive. It's more that he can generate a huge amount of force in a very short time. So uh, then... His, his so say, for instance, someone like... Lot. Yeah, so someone like me, I need longer to generate the same force. So I spend... If I'm jumping, I have to go down lower to get the same yeah. height. So even though you might... I don't know because I haven't compared it, but I'd say he's better than me. But like if me, <laughs> if me and Gunny had the same jump to the same height, but he does it real much quicker, well then he's winning. He's winning every yeah. exchange. Yeah. Yeah. So, and and that's something we're looking at. We actually think that that might be something that could be affected by the weight cut. So even though like vertical jump, as I was saying, is a measure of power. So your power might still, your power output might still have the same end result. But, the but how you get there could be different. The timing of it. The timing of it. And again, it's like timing is everything in MMA. Every. You know, it's absolutely everything in MMA. And that, and I think that's part of it is where it's like, when you feel just slightly off, that could be it. So that's something we're looking into as that's well. A great, but that's a great yeah. way to test it. Like, uh, and and the, the psychological part of that, like uh, a fire at the cut of the weight, and then all of a sudden you put them on the, because that's done with a mat, isn't it? So yeah, the mat's yeah. put down and yeah. you jump and the, the mat reads everything for you. Yeah, so. yeah. And you're getting, as I said, it's like... People at home timing each other, go! Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll yeah, never yeah, get yeah, the time yeah, on you'll that. you never get it right. And, that, and that's the thing is that, like, you look at it, the, the force plates we use, it. you look at the curve it generates and the curve can change. You know what I mean? And then there's like other stuff so we're looking at. you can really put them curves over each other, weight cut and not Exactly, cut exactly. You know exactly, you can, can do a direct comparison between the two. And even like, so say for instance stuff um, with injuries. So say for instance, you have what's called asymmetry. So say for instance, I've, I've done the ACL on my right knee. Um, as I get tired, that asymmetry is more pronounced. So you can see So that when that I'm curve. rested, it's hard to see, but as I get more fatigued, even though it's 15 years since it happened, it shows up. So that could happen as well as as you get fatigued in a fight or get fatigued from a weight cut. The body switches yeah. back. And to I wonder is this, you see a lot of guys injuring themselves the week of fights. And I wonder is that part of it is that they're being too drastic. Or they're a, yeah, their asymmetries are getting worse. So all of a sudden they start getting hurt and stuff like that. So again, you don't know. It's maybe, but like, again, it's like, well, let's test it and see what happens. And yeah. well, as I said, at the start of that, uh, conversation. A lot of this stuff has has taken ten years to kind of even yeah, yeah. figure out what come up with. Yeah. So um, as you mentioned, Chris Fields there, um, still the champion of the sleigh, is he? Oh yeah, he he is the absolute king of the sleigh. He <laughs> so, just the player or the prowler, whatever you want to call it. He just so absolutely kills it. So there's a car park out in the USA and it smells of vomit, and sleds, <laughs> vomit and sleds. And um, they so but w- t- one thing we had more about you was, and I have to say was uh, the idea is of indulging ourselves in, in in what it was we did. You know. What I mean? yeah, like, there's yeah. no doubt I never went in and tried to make a personal best because I just had no interest in that you know what I mean but like, it, it, you went on like uh, like built a grappling area in the in the, the, the sick car park yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so the car park was it's a prowler you push along 
at the end of it, you die, and then someone comes and gets you. <laughs> That's a tough. That was a, like, even the length of that car park. Yeah. Like, if someone uh, asked me to do a lap of that now, it'd probably shiver me with yeah, fear. Yeah, like, the, the straight is just under 70 metres and it's like uh, yeah, it's a we've big shuttle run yeah, for the yeah, shed, yeah. Like. but again it depends on you know heavy, light going for speed high going handle, for, yeah, low yeah, handle yeah, yeah so and even like it's funny like even temperature can affect the grip of the sled so that's one thing we were, you know, that can change as we well. We knew that was messing me up. Yeah, yeah, it was too hot. I remember, I remember one day Owen took us out into the car park, and I don't know whether he's having a bad weekend or something like that. But we had to do a session. Owen introduced us into uh, the kind of the Olympic lifts. I think he was taking the session that day. Yeah. And uh, I love that. I love the Olympic Olympic uh, Olympic lifting. Yeah. The, the idea of like um, the technique part of it, where it's you're not really like lifting something. Yeah, yeah, The snatches yeah. and the techniques of getting it up. I love the idea of technically going through that. But then he took us outside, and he had that old jeep. I don't know what that thing. Was. Yeah, that got robbed on us. <laughs> Did they? Someone robbed it and on the us. Car yeah, back. yeah, yeah, yeah. That, someone robbed it on us. Maybe it was one of you guys. I was just thinking, yeah. one boy with Jeep, one boy with Mike. Yeah, it no, looks no. the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and he remember putting us into a tyre, tying a rope onto the Jeep. And yeah, pulling, yeah, pulling the Jeep. Pulling yeah, the Jeep yeah, and he yeah. had the brakes in it. That's the only thing we wanted to do with that Jeep, was snitch the brakes. Because, oh, and you'd get a little momentum with it, and then he'd put the brakes, and you'd have to start with that momentum again. But that's a good example, it was a good example of, momentum as well like get the momentum going and keep the momentum yeah going. yeah if you stop you that's the problem and yeah. um, the the relays so we sometimes you used to put you in like a queue and you run after each other and you'd push and the next person in the next person in like i remember times like coming down off the ramp yeah oh yeah yeah like, yeah like literally saying like look i'm gonna get sick right now you know what i mean and then having to push a little bit more but, but, but see i think as well as it's important to realize that you can work anybody hard Working someone hard is, is, isn't, you know, daddy, you know, it's easy to smash someone, but it's having, why are we doing this? Yes. So a lot of it was, uh, he's, he's messing with the work to rest ratios to make sure we're mimicking the sport. Right. To, that you get enough recovery so that you get quality the whole time. So yeah. even though you might be feeling like crap, it, it the, the, you're you're giving yourself enough rest that the quality is there the whole time because you know the garbage in garbage out it's like you always want to maintain that quality so it'd be easy for me like there's a there's a prowler downstairs we could just go out and right let's just push it until you get sick but how does that actually benefit you but yeah. it's a case of like push it a short period of time as fast as you can right and that's why you're creating that team because you're distracted by everyone else going this is and you're way. looking going i have three to go I've two to go I've one to go right it's my turn so it's it's kind of engaging all those different or you know things to be like you know so that you're not just working someone hard it's like it's building towards something it's done for a reason rather than oh let's just make you sick and leave it at that 100% yeah. and, and I, I, um, you, you obviously see it now so Use it in the elite of the elite. Many gyms have you got now? We've got three gyms. Three so, now? yeah, Leeson Street, Artane, and Malahide. So. Uh, uh, Hatch Street, is that? Did we move Hatch Street to Leeson Street. Oh, right. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Street or something, is it? Yes and no. It's, it's <laughs> funny how it's like, it, it's mad because it was easier to park in Hatch Street, and there's only about 150 metres between the two gyms. And it's amazing all of a sudden like people like I have to walk 150 metres. Yeah, you're coming into train. What diff like people are mental. Like, <laughs> yeah, well, like it's unbelievable like how people kind of rationalise stuff in their head. It's like I'm gonna go in and work really hard, but I don't want to work walk one minute to work hard. Well, yeah, and that, that is it. I love a yeah. bit of walk. I, sometimes we park far away to to, to have a little walk. Sometimes yeah. we park at the gate there a bit. No, it's only about 50 metres to the door, but you know what I mean? It saves the parking spaces as well at the door. We yeah, you even see that with uh, all the SPG gyms now where it's like the ori now the original for me was Long Mile and it was like you know you were a certain type of person if you trained there I think you were you were into it yeah you had to like stuff like the showers weren't working they were the type of people that'd be like alright grand I'll have a yeah. have well, a horse bath and go off and I'm going, like, <laughs> that was it yeah. where now it's like like when people always ask me I'm opening up a facility what, what do I need to spend my money on should I buy really good bars really good places no spend your money on the bathrooms because yeah. that's the one thing like to, to open up to a bigger market you need to have nice things and even yeah. though they're in their head they'll be like oh the bathrooms don't matter they do 100%. You know, and it, it's kind of, and I, I know I've heard you talking about like it's, it's a certain level of like fighters may, you know, if you want to be a fighter, you have to train in the in the bad gym. Yeah. You can't train in this beautiful gym. You have yeah. to show I what like you're to made see of. The idea of like, you ever see that meme and it's brilliant. It's like, if you haven't trained here, 
you can't train here. Yeah, yeah or you can't you, compete here. You can't yeah, compete yeah. here or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great... Um, I don't know whether it's, it's a tool. It's yeah. as, as important as a dumbbell or as important as oh, a pair no, of gloves. Like, definitely, there's a, as I said, it's like to, to appeal to a broad market, you know, you have to have nice things, you have to have nice facilities, yeah. it's clean, It's but, but for that, you know, cutting edge, there has to be a certain level of hardship to get to that top yeah, level. Yeah, it, like, it, has it, to be, it has to be some sort yeah. of foundation of a baseline. Yeah, it's, it's, and there's, not, there's nothing wrong with, like, wanting nice things, no, but it's just 100%. a case of, well, then maybe the, the upper limit is not for you, and that's fine as well. It's like, it's okay if someone's like, you know, I want to train jiu-jitsu two, two, three days a week in a nice, clean environment. Perfect. 100%. But if you're like, oh, I want to go to the UFC and fight for titles, but I only want to train two, three days a week in a nice facility, you're kind of like, mm, no, that's yeah. not going to happen. But as I said, it depends on what's your, what's your goal and what are you willing to sacrifice to get there. Like that can, you know, the, the facility can change that. But as you said, it's like, look at who came out of that gym. Yeah. Like it's incredible. Like when people talk about like you look at you know what you you know athletes all your life yeah so but like even all of them coming out of the same uh, same little area yeah you know what I mean so it's like you had this gym in Dublin that what like eight people went to the UFC mm. in? like in a population of just over a million people and, and another to thing, centralize this, this is the thing we said to Conor last one was when we said everyone that put it in done well yeah the, as uh, John Kavanagh used to say the MMA nerds the yeah. people who would train and hang around. And go through everything and then do that again later that day. Yeah, it's not like, and I, I try to explain that to guys as well. It's like, it's like, you'll show me. And I'm like, yeah, I will show you. But you have to believe in it. And, like, and you might think you believe in it until like a technique or getting back to their feet or something like that. You'll only believe in it when it works and then it works again and again and again. And now you're like, right, that's how I get up. And it's like, yeah. I know, I told you. And you're like, I don't know, we made that up. It's like, it's only because you believe in it now that you really own it. And to me, that's that's the main thing. Do you get what I mean? If they they own the techniques that they're using to get back the same way as like weight cuts and stuff like that. And you have to own it, and I, and I think uh, that's what I was kind of talking about with that. Uh, I think as well as when you've been through the process a couple of times, you're relaxed. You know what's going to happen because people look, oh my God, I'm six kilos over, and it's tomorrow, yeah. and it's like, yeah, but I was seven kilos the last day, and I made it. So you're like, oh, or I'm exactly where I was the last time. So it relaxes Scales you. Scales planning. You know, yeah, exactly. And it's it's the same thing with different positions. If you're used to being in there, you know how to get out of that position, and that relaxes you. Being in the situation that relaxes you, you know, and, and the same thing of like, um, I think getting to the bigger shows for you guys because of the path you kind of went through, by the time you got there, it wasn't that different. You know, the actual, it wasn't like all of a sudden you got to a show and there was a camera was crew there. Said, was camera, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you know, like I've been at shows where it's literally a cage in a GAA hall and there's no lights. It's the full lights. There's no lights on the cage and there's yeah. no announcer. Or, you know, so by the time you got to the UFC, you were used to that kind of Bigger show atmosphere. Well, they, yeah. you know, I, I mentioned it all the time. Um, the, the cage contender show used they to be... They were brilliant. They, they were amazing. Shows. We've like, always... Like, and anybody yeah. that's had on, is, that, that, was, that was a great little... Uh, it was like... It, it was like the Coliseum before the Coliseum. Yeah, but if you look at... You ever see Gladiator where he's bringing the, the, the Gladiators to like the, the smaller Coliseum? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. One day we'll, we'll make it back to Rome. Yeah, and yeah, it's yeah. Like, yeah. It's exactly like that. It's kind of like what it was like but, with the, the tree arena. But you look at that and it was like 3,000, 4,000 people at it. Yeah. yeah, it was like. How did he get them in? Yeah, and like in fairness, like it was some production, like you know, you'd ha like the thing where where uh, when Roddy was fighting uh, Shannon Gurgity and oh, you never can pronounce the guy, the leg lock guy, you said Tanko. You should tank off. Yeah, like for but, the, but you look at the videos from that. You think it was a U almost a UFC event? Yeah, and, and like, that 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 you know, the severe of a big was it? Yeah, yeah, they it. made it look great, and then oh. John uh, Redden, no, what was his name? The guy who ran the show. Ferguson. Ferguson. Yeah, John, yeah, yeah. John yeah. Redmond is Johnny Jitsu. Johnny Jitsu. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, but and but like they created the rivalry with him and Chris, and it was like build up to it, and it was like me and Chris were talking about. Yeah, it. Did yeah, you see that? yeah, yeah. It was cringy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you're standing in the square in your pants. Yeah, so yeah. Screaming yeah. at you. You're in for a fight. It's like that's why we're all here. But even that, like even doing the weigh-ins in, like uh, I remember one of them was like in Connolly Station, yeah. and there's probably people trying to catch a train. They're like, what's going on oh, here? Well, like, yeah, but you know? I have to say that was probably the worst idea ever because it was like freezing and I had to weigh in and, in and go all the way into Connolly Station on a bleeding bus because like, <laughs> I had a, a lift in or a car or something yeah, yeah. they had weigh and then 
get the boys home, I yeah, suppose. Yeah, yeah. And you're in the middle of it, you're fighting the next day as well. So it's yeah, like, but they like they were great shows, and then the like the Cage Warriors and the Helix, like they're. They were amazing shows, they, like, you know. It was a mad little build up in that yeah. little boy. And as I it. said, to, to, to make the next step isn't that hard. And I think, as I said, it's all of that feeds into it. Like, it was an unbelievable scene. It was just to see it from, from where it went, like. It was from the, like, definitely. But I even find it funny now, like, when you still answer questions, like, like about, oh, is this, uh, is this real? Is this, you know, this uh, human cockfight? And you're kind of like, the people are still oh, asking. Was stop. that not like. 2013, 2012 when it's people so are asking that, that. Is. Yeah. Like, it, it, it really is down to like obviously like ignorant people people yeah. that are kind of like still they never changed their view of it they, they only ever surround themselves with people like, it's, a, it's a sport in the, the way that that's taken over and not just for, for adults like yeah. all the way like the evidence is there you're talking downstairs is about the the, the, the kids development you know yeah, what I mean yeah. like I, I see it in front of my eyes all the time and, and any mother or thing like that mm. uh, on the 29th of this month we're open uh, so the, the, we're open the, a year one year from the open day yeah, yeah. like and in a year the amount of kids that have came here and joined and, and kind of found friends and lost weight and, and some have like, graduated onto the other programs and stuff like that and some are really really into jiu jitsu they have an interest they have, they have a hobby so the development of it I see it first hand all the time is from kids down that age imagine yeah. what that's going to be like but like for because I have three young kids myself and like looking three at now, three now Jesus yeah, you don't. ever out of saddle oh, no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no not anymore yeah. um, I'm done catching up now yeah I'm, I'm, I'm not, yeah, yeah I was talking to Chelsea about that at the opening but I look at the, the things for me kids to do right so they're saying for full human development what you have to do is you have to learn another language a musical instrument and a martial art to get full development as a person because it, they all tap different physical abilities, different parts of your brain, and you kind of have to approach each of them differently, right? And it's like, it, when people are talking about stuff for their kids to do, you know, you're not putting glo gloves on them and getting them to absolutely lump the head off each other. That never happens. Like <laughs> Never. You watch videos of, say, <clears throat> uh, peewee football, which is like, underage American football in the States and kids knocking each other out, kids crying and, and parents cheering it on. And it's like, now not that, the, the, again, it's YouTube, it could be a microcosm of what you're actually looking at, but like when these guys come in and do a, a martial art, or any martial art, but like it teaches you discipline. And I think one of the things as well is it, it teaches kids, it gets aggression out of kids. That's what we find. It and I think as well as that, it, it, like I remember, uh, again, coming back to Cotter saying that he, he used to get in fights until he started martial arts. And it gets that out of you. And I think it teaches you a respect of like, I don't know who I could be fighting. I, I actually don't want to fight. I'm, enough, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable enough in myself that I don't need to go out and prove that. This now that goes it. from little kids to teenagers to adults. To men, yeah. And like as I said, it's like it teaches you don't get in fights because you don't know who you're fighting. Because I remember like coming down and we would have done jujitsu together. And I'm like, look at the size of me compared to this fella. Like, I'm gonna <laughs> smash him just from pure physical ability. Yeah. Not a chance. You know what I mean? And it teaches <laughs> you like. I remember rolling with you and Owen and stuff oh, like yeah, that. And, Owen, and Owen's like way bigger than me. Oh, <laughs> like, yeah. And you'd be like, 50 but it, like kilo soaking wet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like, you know, it teaches you a respect to be like. You know, you could be out on a night out and it's like, you know, I'm not starting anything here because even though he, he looks like whatever, yeah. I don't know what's going on there. You it's know? A, it's a now, you do the whole thing now where you look at people's ears. Yeah, <laughs> the ears are here to the sun. the sun, man. I've only yeah. had to figure it out. Cauliflower ears in the sun. Ooh. What, getting burnt easy? Yeah, it's like uh, hot stones. Oh, because they're sick and out. And they're so hard. It's like yeah, hot yeah. stones on the bleeding yolk. But it, it's like all those things. It's like you're teaching those kids life lessons that they can carry into any you know, uh, part of life. And I think it's good for kids to see as well as that. Like one of the things from jiu-jitsu I think that really shows is if you work harder than the other person, you're going to be better. Yeah. Like, take, even if it's for a little while where y you're not, you're suffering. Yeah, yeah. If you outwork that person, you will become better than Yeah, 100%. Them. Like with certain things, like say for instance, like physical attribute stuff, like so say for instance you take sports in the Olympics, like I could work way harder than Usain Bolt I could take all the steroids in the world and I'm never running faster than him. But if you put in a skill thing, it's like you can teach your kids that if you work really hard at this, you will eventually become better than Especially that Especially at that age. At that age, yeah. development yeah. is, is they, they've, what, 20 yeah. years? But again, if you take that lesson, you can apply it to anything then. 
like I remember one of my friends, he's a like he's his PhD in law, and when we were in school together, me and him, like he's a PhD, I'm studying for PhD. Two of us did foundation or Irish. But like, it. Yeah, but it was <laughs> more it was more a class off more than we were idiots. But he had it in his head he couldn't learn a language. Right? He was like, no, I'm not built that way. He married a Filipino girl and learned Tagalog, which is the Filipino language, just through exposure, through just being like being another uh, good lesson is being willing to fail and keep going yeah. and be willing to look foolish and keep going. And he learned Tagalog and off that he's learned Spanish. And then he knows a bit of French now off that so as he's well. Learned the, he's learning the structure of learning. It, but he's n- it's not that he's learning a specific task. He's learning how to learn. Yeah, learning how yeah, to learn. Yeah. Like learning it, the structure of it. Yeah. And it, it's kind of another thing is like that, the having a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. So when he came out of school, he had a fixed mindset of, I am bad at languages. Yeah. Right. Oh, you would have. We'd have probably had that myself. Yeah, I am, I am bad at languages, so that's a fixed mindset, and it's always amazing. I find this because, like, working with general population, I always like listening to people self talk, and when people are negative, it's very affirmative, very definite language. I am terrible at yeah. X. Where when they want to be positive, it's like I wish that if someday maybe I could do that. Yeah. But and then with a growth mindset, as a growth mindset is, you know, learn who's good at that learn how they got good at it and then I just have to mimic that and, that, and, I, and, and as I said like martial arts especially jiu-jitsu I think because it is because there's so many parts of it, it, it you know physical attributes are important but they're not the deciding factor no. by a long way well, so if you, you know? look at some of the best guys in the world they're probably guys that are like the non like aggressive guys that you'll see like look at like the Meow brothers and look at like Keenan Cornelius if you must yeah know. yeah Keenan yeah Keenan Cornelius yeah. probably the biggest nerd you'll ever see you know yeah I mean? yeah and, and, and it like, suits jiu jitsu oh, but it, 100%. but again it teaches you that like I just it's how I approach the problem not the problem yeah you know it's how I look at this problem and you know it, it, again it's like well brute force didn't work well maybe there's a subtler way of doing it maybe you know and 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 just being you know, as I said, it's like, and that's brilliant for kids. It's brilliant for teenagers. Brilliant, brilliant for adults. Like exactly, that's the it, 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 it's it's an over the board development kind of skill. Yeah, I yeah. Been, like the idea I find is, um, I want to teach his kids very well, and I, I found this because I've seen it in my own son as well. Um, that boys and girls as well are very even when it comes to jiu-jitsu and more off what you say to kids I think girls get better at jiu-jitsu quicker yeah. than boys <clears throat> I don't know why but well I think it's they're able to pay attention better like I see that with we my, were, my were, daughter yeah. with, with, with my we son we were saying like, it downstairs because yeah. like, kids doing it, like a handstand picking his nose and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. looking at what's going on and it's not it's not it's not rocket science what's going on there one's paying attention and one's not paying attention Yeah. and I really find as I said uh, the, the, the girls get get it a lot easier and then say if you put like a, a lad in with a girl to roll even if he's kind of calm with and someone else and he's learning how to train when that crossover comes again you can see him getting right, right. I'm back into being under pressure I'm back like because I can't I, like in a way I can't lose to a girl it's hard yeah, yeah, yeah. but then after a little while yeah you're going to lose to a, you're going to lose to, to, you're going to be choked by a girl you're going to be stuck on the ground where you're not able to get out she's going to pin your hands you're going to feel terrible then you have to have a little conversation with yourself like as a kid or as an adult one or the other but again as I said is you could have that fixed mindset where you're like I, I like I can't lose to a girl. So what am I gonna do? I'm not gonna spar with girls. Is this usually the guy that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the, the bully. Dog? The yeah, bully will exactly. leave because he's he's used to being in control. He's used to being in charge. Where yeah. the growth mindset is like, why did I lose? What happened there? And can I figure it out? I figured this out early. Yeah. This is the one I think <clears throat> I figured with. Um, like I went in and at the time, actually bashed me. You know what I mean? And yeah, I yeah. Like, I I think I walked off with the the the, the mindset of like. Fuck that! What what's going on there? You know what I mean. But then the growth mindset kicked in. I was like, I need to f- like I need to figure that out. Yeah, but you can go between the two. You know what I mean. You can go between the two. Like that emotional. Res- a lot of times the emotional, emotional response, response is the fixed mindset, yeah, yeah, and then it's yeah. like, and it's okay. You, sometimes you need to have that. Right, it's on my system. Let's move on. Let's move on. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, and again, it's like that's why it's important to be like you have to be willing to fail to get better. You know, and I, as I was saying, like yeah, with yeah. the language thing, is like. Um, <clears throat> the company I used to work for, it was a lot of French Canadians, and a boot? yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, they're, they're French Canadians are filthy. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, no, they're they're not. No, they're, they're not. not the yeah, 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 yeah. They're they're yeah, they're they're a little bit different. They're, 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 but 
I would always try and speak French. Isn't but that the best episode of Car- uh, South Park ever, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, sorry to skip off of that. That was the best one ever. But, like, when, when I would speak French to, to one of my, like, he's one of my mentors in strength and conditioning and... Uh, Who was that? Uh, a guy called Andre Benoit. Yeah. yeah. But he would always correct me and, and he'd, he'd, like, just say, I'd be like, ah, oh, saying toilet. And he'd be like, no, it's toilet. I was like, that's what I said. Yeah. <laughs> and then he'd keep correcting me and I'd be just like, Right, I'm not even talking to you about this. We just spent the whole time. But then there was a, 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 another girl, Mary Pierre, who she'd be like, "Oh, your French is really good, John." And I'd be like, "It is really good." And I talked to her, you know. So it's that Confidence. kind. Of, yeah. So, it, but it was kind of like you don't need to be perfect at it. And the same thing when you're coaching your kids, it's like it doesn't need to be perfect. They just need to be doing it and, and approaching it. And the yeah, right and it, yeah, and it, they, they will repetition. get better at it eventually. Yeah. Like. I, I think, um, especially with jiu-jitsu, the idea of them playing a game becomes a game. Of, oh, I'm trying to get past the legs to get points because that's called passing guard. Yeah. And, like, all you got to do is get past the legs. He's going to try and stop you. Do you get what I mean? But then yeah. you see the one kid that like, now it's like, oh, I'm going to kick them to death yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Some game, they are, the game is just stopping them getting past the legs and, yeah. and it's it's a game but it's passing guard mm. so a few little things I wanted to ask you before I wrap up um, the myth the myth of right. not having sex before a fight oh, yeah, I, know, I think I've asked you this yeah. before um, I actually read a study on this right. Like, imagine that being in the control group and you can't have sex <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but yeah it's it's, if you're used it's again if you always have sex beforehand keep having sex there's beforehand because there's been four years like way back in the day now, when yeah, we're yeah. making legs now, if you remember in uh, in uh, Rage and Bull yeah this like, is the Robert, you know, he, he gets it's up and pours the ice kill. yeah but it, it, it's, it, it comes from this right uh, like it's funny when you look back and see where this stuff came from right so uh, the guy who invented Kellogg's right mm. The guy, uh, I think it's John Kellogg or something his name is, but he was really anti any type of uh, sort of sexual pleasure, right? And how he came up with uh, cornflakes was he wanted to feed you something so nutrient deficient that you didn't have energy to either masturbate or have sex. Really? So he like he was one of these thought like because this is and uh, like well, I read I read about the, well I read I read about this in in the history of breakfast right and that's a, again another myth is so he came up with this as a way and then his partner was like listen we're gonna have to put sugar in it because this t- stuff is shocking bad so he his partner added it in but it was it was based off that whole thing and it kind of built from that of like sex is bad it takes something away from you yeah right. you know and that's where it kind of built from and that just fed into into performance and there's actually like when you look at the history of it, it's like where did it come from you know what i mean it's not like you know guys blew their load and all of a sudden they couldn't do anything it was like it, it, as i said it was like it started from this kind of american puritanical you know having you know impure thoughts is evil and it kind of just built from there so there's no actual scientific yeah unless like you're fucking sting and you're having like six hour sex sessions or something like <laughs> yeah. that and, and you're, you're bollocks but and like you're in the middle of yeah, yeah. as well but if like yeah if you're just getting in there doing the job and you know there's no effect there was a way the sex to cut weight Oh yeah, emptying our nuts. <laughs> a few grams. Hundred grams. <laughs> I'd say it's like a, a, a one-eyed mouse weeping. I'd say halfway through. At that away. point, Could, yeah, yeah. Yeah, going on there, Rob. Uh, yeah, yeah. Rob just gathering some funky yeah. shit. You can go okay. through. Okay. The, the most serious stuff is over. I think. Yeah. The, the, the sex talk. That yeah, was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was mind blowing though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never touching cornflakes again. Yeah. <laughs> That's how it started yeah. though. It's it's yeah. amazing when you you look at the history of stuff like yeah. this. It's crazy. That is mental. Yeah. yeah. That's what I'm gonna say next time. It, it's the cornflakes. It's not me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's gonna be no headache excuses. It's gonna be cornflakes. Oh yeah. no, we only had cornflakes today. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. So I I uh, interestingly with the weather at the minute, uh, a lot of people are giving out about. Seagulls, have you heard oh, really? about this? Oh. So they're going like to quote a politician from like a year ago. They've lost the run of themselves, in the sense that uh, the the big thing that that that's happening at the minute is if you go to the seaside. So if you're out near Hout, uh, Malahoid, any of those like places, scaries, people are getting fish and chips. Like seagulls are swooping in, they're taking the fish and they're just flying off. Like really? Yeah. So like, oh, it'd be fucking war. <laughs> it's a free for all. Like one little girl got slapped in the face by a seagull's wing the other day. Uh, 
and this one just took the whole box, like fish, chips. Yeah, what are you everything. fucking about? I'm coming for a little chip. Yeah. You got to admire them to, to a, a certain point. The thing is, though, like, uh, as well as that, they're nesting on a lot of roofs and stuff, um, like, in this weather, and they're waking people up at, like, something like half four, five in the morning. Just, time just I get from, up. Yeah. <laughs> Stop, yeah. yeah. <laughs> time we come back into the house. <laughs> We've never seen that time in the morning, yeah. ever. And then in uh, in the UK, like on the south coast, uh, I think Somerset or something like that, um, they've even been getting drunk, the seagulls. Seagulls have? Yeah. Seagulls are on the... Sea- so British like, seagulls. Oh, no, British seagulls. Yeah. <laughs> British seagulls. They better not be saying yeah. it's coming home. <laughs> yeah, I hope not. Someone, did you see that video? Someone got a seagull, because everyone's giving out about seagulls uh, in the UK and Ireland at the minute, and someone got a seagull and did that. They, they put it, it's coming up. It's coming up. <laughs> <home. laughs> oh my God. Yeah, bad. But uh, these seagulls, anyway, they were like, they were like those those birds are really sick. Like, I think it might be this. And, and they took them into a lab, like, and then he noticed, like, that their van just reeked of, like, booze, like, <laughs> the seagulls <laughs> in the back. Like, fish and chips. They've they been were, watching for a while. That's yeah, what's going on. They were stumbling, uh, they were stumbling, getting sick and falling over, like, um, and then they just, like, recovered, like, and then it was like, there's nothing wrong with those birds. They're just fucking drunk, like. I say it. It's probably only yeah. a bird flu. Or something I think like they that. got That's a hangover. Me, yeah. Yeah. bird flu. Yeah, people thought it was bird flu. I think what they thought. I think um, they they must have got at some like uh, some brewery or something like they some contaminated water or something like that. I don't know, but it's a coincidence that the football's going on, isn't it? Like and all the seagulls are, are getting the drunk. Yeah, but yeah. I tell you, what I say is like what the good weather. Everyone's drinking outside. They're yeah, leaving they're points the behind. Food. There's actually you a know. great fish and chips out with the lady uh, poo. Okay, you get it here. Just, just <laughs> yeah. taking the fish and chips. We love our fish and chips. But uh, just yeah. watch out next time. If a seagull ate my fish and chips, I would find them. <laughs> you'd find, you'd have to go after one. Yeah, I'd pay to see that patty. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'd be down at one lady poo with a shotgun. <laughs> <Out of it. laughs> Birds! <laughs> like yeah. if That'd jet. be interesting to see. Or would you just go ah, and run off? Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe that's exactly what it would do. Yeah. It would be. You haven't had the exposure to it, so yeah, you know. So we'd have to see. <laughs> yeah, but a seagulls are big. Seagulls are size of chicken. I remember we we were in Australia, and we were driving along. We got married in Australia, and uh, my brother had put like um, you know like wedding bell, silver wedding bell, like plastic little things on his car, and as we were driving up, and. Uh, we were driving along and we look at this like bird in the air and we're like he's coming for us and all of a sudden he just goes Poof! drops and his wingspan was wider than the car like that, whatever it was it was an eagle or something like that and pulled the uh, uh, the, bell the bells off the car oh it was like, oh, like and it was because you just see him circling circling and then the speed he dropped, and you're like, no wonder he kills mice and kills like rabbits and all. Like the speed like he was the out. The way he was dropping. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, tell you not all that stuff. Oh, he was out me back digging a trench yesterday, right? And I looks up, and there was about three or four boards going around my head. And I was thinking, they know I'm going to die soon. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right? Look at that they, ginger fella in the heat. He's, he's dead soon. Like, he is a sitting duck, he is, you know what I mean? Excuse was that where you put, that's, that's when you put the cap on, right? Oh, stop, how the hell, man? I'm about to get burnt all in the back I've of my neck that, and all, trying to turn it. That's a bad one, isn't it? And my arms are up to here and all. Yeah. I was just saying the whole last night, do you think I need to go to the hospital? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sweating out of my bed. No one's walking. No one's walking. Yeah, it's just, it's too hot. Do you know what? I haven't put it on in years, but I heard of it yesterday. Calamine lotion. Oh, yeah, Remember yeah, that? Yeah, 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 yeah. You used to get yeah. chicken pox, I'm mad. Covey yeah. in calamine lotion. You'd be stuck, you would be. You'd be like, something like the covey in milk. I mean, perfect. Though. It's like milk. It's the same color of milkshake or something. Isn't yeah, it? like, but kind of yeah. No, but it looks like you've spilled. It looks like yeah. you spilled yeah. milk yeah. on, on you. Yeah. It sticks on you yeah. and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. But uh, I think I'll be going get a bit of calamine yeah. out. Yeah. Uh, here's an interesting one, right? Uh, on this week in 1981, Donkey Kong first appeared in uh, arcades all okay. around, mainly around America. Um, the thing is, it was Mario's first appearance uh, ever. So he like, was Mario's pet. Uh, was he married? Yeah. yeah. I only heard that yesterday. Donkey okay. Kong yeah, was yeah. Mario's pet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And Fucking Mario became quite the, the, yeah. the, the big one ever, like. Uh, yeah, so that was Mario's first appearance. But this is the most interesting thing about that, right? Um, 
So what was uh, he was his pet? Was he? I, didn't I know think. That. I think that's. Okay. I heard that again. Okay. It's like I don't yeah. know Nintendo folklore, yeah. so I'm yeah. probably wrong. But Mario really must have been a <laughs> Mario must have been a shit owner then for him to go like <laughs> and steal his. So he, Donkey Kong. Mario seen all the all the yeah. publicity he was getting. Yeah, 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 yeah. There, yeah. So the whole concept for Donkey Kong um, was that Donkey Kong likes this big ape. Uh, he steals Mario's girlfriend and brings Princess? her. Yeah. No. This is I'm getting to that, right? <laughs> I'm getting to that. Yeah. So Donkey Kong goes off, right? Uh, and goes like some it's a construction yard or a building site or yeah, it's just loads of framework. Yeah, and yeah. he climbs to the top of it. Mario has to go get his girlfriend back. And Donkey Kong's just throwing barrels at him. So you have to jump over the barrels, get to the top, and get your girlfriend. And there's like four levels. Um so you do that anyway, and and Mario saves the day, he gets his girlfriend back, they go home. I'm guessing Donkey Kong goes home with them too. <laughs> their pet, like, which... Let's just call it, where does he live then? Yeah. yeah. So he's just yeah. AWOL. He's like, sorry about that. Yeah, he's in the bowl corner, like, yeah. Go back he, to our barrel. He was the best in Mario Kart. Yeah, he was the best yeah. one to have, yeah. He was an animal. Mario Kart yeah. was one of the best games oh, ever. Stop. Yeah. You'd still play that game. Yeah. Like, it's a brilliant game, yeah. Oh, especially if you yeah. had about three or four of these. Yeah, yeah, the and, split screens. Yeah, ganging up on guys. And but all. this is the thing, right? His girlfriend in Donkey Kong isn't, isn't the, the same princess. girlfriend that he has today. So Mario's a bit of a he upgraded. He's a player. <laughs> he upgraded somewhere along the line, like. And he got a princess. Do you know what his name? Do you know what? His, yeah, Princess Peach is, is who he's with now. Like, and she's all right. You've <laughs> <laughs> right. seen a picture. Uh, he. Do you know what he was going out with in in Donkey Kong? A girl named uh, Pauline. <laughs> Pauline. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's not a redhead. You had a thing for redhead. How <laughs> random. We have, I, actually, I actually have a picture here. I'll show you what she looked like. You can coin it. You can coin it see what you upgraded. <laughs> Polly. There she is there. Um, Give us a look at this. And if you swipe... So that's where they are, right? Oh, my God. Oh, <laughs> swipe right, right? You'll see... If you swipe right, you'll see, like... Uh, <laughs> but who, who's the one that are right? That's, that's Princess, Princess Peach. That's, that's who he's going out with now. So that was his. That was his before he made money, girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is Pauline. This is his, his um his solid woman that had his back all the way, and then he switches. Princess <laughs> <laughs> Peaches, that is rough, Mario. We ain't gonna be. We ain't getting on like we used to. Yeah, yeah. He's That's Italian a, though, isn't he? Like he's an Italian. Yeah, and yeah. and is there any little side story about Luigi there? Or is he just getting employed? Did he? One of his mates got a job, and he's like, "We get you in." Well, I'll tell you what. No wonder why Luigi's pissed off. Like you see, like the chicks that Mario was getting, we'd be angry with him too. Like yeah, and he's taller and all. He's, yeah. a little, he's a little small fat lad, and he's the he's the tall handsome one, yeah. isn't he? Donkey Kong was four years before uh, the first Mario Brothers game. You can actually play the game online for free on a website called freekong.org. Oh, uh, really? If anyone wants to. Is there a few games on there? No, it's just Donkey Kong. Um, I think there's only four levels in the first game. <laughs> we bounce onto that. Yeah. <laughs> John, it's been a pleasure to have you in. As always. Absolute yeah. legend. Um, episode 35, as I was saying. Make sure you tune in. Subscribe. Um, if you want to get some clips and stuff like that, Robin puts them together and there's some crackers there, some funny clips there is on the No Shame Cast Instagram page. Give it a little follow on the YouTube. Try to subscribe to the page. It's good karma. Look after yourself. I can't believe how fast that went. That's